Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Or as uh, a certain rock band was want to say, welcome back, my friends, to the show that never ends, uh, making something good of NAFTA. Um, I'm Adam Posen, president of the Peterson Institute for International Economics. And I am as ever proud to say that, but particularly as we continue the Institute's legacy of work right at the frontier of analytics and relevance to make the trading system work sustainably in both political and economic senses and beneficially for all involved. Uh, we have had an ongoing project here at the Institute, primarily with internal authors, but with some very distinguished external authors, some of whom will be speaking today, uh, led by my colleagues Fred Bergston and Monica Debola. Uh, we are publishing today, officially, a PIIE briefing, a path forward for NAFTA. Uh, we're trying to be trade and environment, so the copies are available for download from the website for free. I'm not passing out heavy cardstock colored copies. Uh, the important thing to say is that a bad trade deal is a very strange concept. And Fred Bergson's chapter, which some people have already seen that we've, we've seen cited in various places and already released, talks about the mistakes conceptually and in the U.S. interest that the Trump administration makes if it were to go down this road of thinking even in NAFTA in bilateral terms. Self-defeating would be one word, wasteful would be another. But there are things that must be done to make NAFTA sustainable, in, again, in both the political and economic senses, that is, to have the full buy-in of people and to reflect the fact that it is 25 years since the agreement. Now, there had been an effort to get those things done in TPP. Uh, that's not going to happen right now. But we are going to make the effort to say what those are, to explain why they're in the U.S. interest, why they are largely win-win for Canada and for Mexico, and why a renegotiation for NAFTA is a positive-sum game, or putting it bluntly, good for the American consumer and worker. It is also, of course, critically important to our relationship with the U.S.'s two neighboring democracies and countries, uh, with millions of people and millions of workers integrated with our economy and in our security interest. And I am delighted to have my colleague, our friend John Hamry here today, who will be giving an opening keynote on the security aspects as we look beyond the simply narrow economic aspects of this. You know, it is cheap talk, and some of my friends on the serious left um, got very offended when people would invoke the security reasons for trade deals, even though FDR and Cordell Hull and others starting way back had taught us that that's for real. Um, and so we had a lot of poo-pooing about, well, if TPP's for security reasons, that's just the last refuge of those desperate neoliberals. Well, we're very quickly finding out visibly what it means when the U.S. withdraws from regional agreements, when the U.S. withdraws from global leadership, when the U.S. leaves its allies hanging. As I'm sure John will make the case in a far more sophisticated fashion, leaving Mexico and Canada hanging is about the worst thing the U.S. can do. And causing disruption in Mexico would be a natural result of an ugly breakup or bad renegotiation of NAFTA and would have tremendous repercussions. Part of the background on NAFTA going back and forth and why it becomes so controversial is there was the drama of the overselling from both sides 20, 20 plus years ago about what would happen to U.S. jobs to Mexico. Nobody ever talked about Canada, but it was going to be good about, for Canada as well. Um, but we've now reached the ridiculous state of affairs, which unfortunately the president and others of the administration sometimes seem to echo, as well as some on the left of the Democratic Party, of saying, since NAFTA did not transform Mexico into the Netherlands it, and did not create a manufacturing sector 
far beyond what any technology could support these days. Therefore, it must be to blame for Mexico's problems and to blame for the decline of the manufacturing sector. And when I state it this way, which I think is an accurate summary of some of their contentions, it shows you the fundamental illogic of the position. Trade alone will never be enough to save Mexico from all its issues, just as trade alone will never triumph over technology and the need for rationalization and global integration in our manufacturing chains, notably the auto sector. But trade alone is a necessary condition to get Mexico on the right track, to keep our auto sector competitive, to keep our economy competitive, and to keep stability in North America. And so it is, again, with pride, with pleasure, and frankly, with determination that the Peterson Institute has undertaken this major project, and we're glad to have you with, here, with us here today for the second round. As we go beyond, a month ago, we had a number of discussions of specific sectors, rules of origin, modalities of the trade agreement, and today we move on to security, environment, energy, new issues, I do want to thank a couple people, obviously Monica and Fred, whose leadership and editorial drive has shaped this project. I want to thank our partners from CG, Center for International Governance Innovation in Canada, who we partner with on a number of issues, but what's obviously the logical choice for us to work with on NAFTA, Domenico Lombardi is here with us today, Patrick LeBond will be speaking later. And I want to thank CSIS, which, of course, has partnered with PIAE in the past on such issues as the China balance sheet and Russia. When economics and foreign policy come together, the two leading nonpartisan think tanks can come together and say, this is in the US interest, this is in the world's interest, and I hope that combination will resonate. Finally, but not least, I would like to thank the Chubb Company and our new board member, Evan Greenberg, who had the vision to say to us, Go big on your NAFTA project, and we will support your trying to get the word out. And we are doing so through every means we have, and if we can help any of you get the facts out about NAFTA, about our U.S. trade, please let us know. We're eager to help. With that, I turn to my colleague, Fred Bergston, who will introduce the morning's keynote speaker. Thank you, Adam, and welcome to all. As Adam implied, all economic events, certainly trade events, occur in a political context. And so we thought it would be uh, essential, as well as appropriate, to try to set the political and security dimensions within which NAFTA is taking place and in which the renegotiation discussion will take place. It's particularly appropriate because when you look back at the history of US international economic policy throughout the entire post-war period, you will discover that every major initiative was undertaken fundamentally for foreign policy and national security reasons. You had to get the economics right. Obviously, the economics had to be positive and therefore supportive. But the fundamental drivers were foreign policy and national security, particularly when it came to getting congressional approval. And in this case, there's the famous story, which is true, that when the NAFTA legislation was teetering in the balance in the Congress in 1993, the decisive blow was struck by General Colin Powell, at the time chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. General Powell said to a group of undecided senators, gentlemen, if you do not sign this agreement, one of my successors may have to put five US divisions on the southern border. At which point the senator said, where do we sign, general? And the bill passed. Today, we're going to discuss that set of security issues in some depth. Nobody better to do it than John Hamry. As Adam said, our close colleague and frequent collaborator from CSIS, he was inspired by our small building to build a beautiful large building. <laughs> and it was right about at the time that he and I were together working out the China balance sheet project. Uh, where we collaborated very successfully uh, between our two. Uh, John uh, has been president of CSIS since 2000 and made enormous uh, strides there. And CSIS, of course, plays a 
a really uh, a dominant role in the discussion of national security, foreign policy issues in this city and more broadly. Uh, prior to that, he had been Deputy Secretary of Defense, before that, Under Secretary of Defense, and from 2007 forward, while he was at CSIS, he served as Chairman of the Defense Policy Board, uh, serving four Secretaries of Defense in that uh, context. Uh, prior to his Pentagon experience, he'd spent 10 years uh, at the Senate Armed Services Committee. Uh, prior to that, a number of years at the Congressional Budget Office, where he was its Deputy Assistant Director for National Security and International Affairs, all this after having done his PhD with distinction from SAIS just two doors down the street. So this is old home week for John. Uh, it's a great pleasure to welcome you back to the podium of the Institute. We look forward to your setting the national security and foreign policy context for the NAFTA renegotiation. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Well, I must say, I did take my inspiration for our building from this facility. This is a splendid uh, facility, and, it, and of course, it's, it reflects the wonderful work that you've been doing here for so many years. Congratulations to you, Fred. and. Uh, and Adam has done a terrific job of, of keeping things moving forward, and it's really been, uh, it's been exciting to watch. Um, you know, the program says I'm supposed to talk for a whole long time. I'm not going to. Uh, it's going to be a lot shorter. But you, your introduction did inspire me to s add something that I had not planned to talk about, and that was TPP. Uh, I worked very hard uh, with the national security community to try to get TPP adopted. Indeed, I think TPP was uh, and is still probably the most important security initiative that we can do for the United States in Asia. Um, you know, Asians want America in Asia. It isn't simply the byproduct of World War II that we're there. They want us there. But they don't want us stomping around in 12 league boots throughout Asia. They want us walking around in carpet slippers. You know, I mean, that's, they want us there. They know what we are. They know the depth that we bring. But they don't want us to be there as a military presence. They want us to be there as an economic presence. And we are in the largest competition conceivable uh, as we see the rise of China. It is a competition. It's not a hostile thing, but it could become hostile. And it's very important for us to be able to shape that environment that is not going to be done through naval presence. That's not going to be done with boots on the ground, military boots. It's going to be done with America being engaged economically in Asia. Far and away, the most important security initiative is TPP. Because TPP establishes the norm under which the future will evolve. I mean, we, there are three great questions. China now knows, the first question, they, that they cannot push America out of Asia. America now knows that we cannot contain China. Honestly, we've never tried, but there have been some people who would like to. It's, it's clear that's not possible. We're now dealing with the third question, and we do not have an answer for the third question, and that is, what is the relationship that China and the United States have together as it relates to everybody else in Asia? The Chinese are looking for vassal states. We're looking for allies. We have the upper hand, but it's not an upper hand that you're going to sustain through military force. It's an upper hand that we sustain by building economic relationships, deep, profound economic relationships, and establishing the norm of how those relationships will evolve. That's what TPP was about. I didn't personally, I don't personally know the details of TPP in terms of what it meant for the auto industry or for others. I don't know what that is, but I do know what the procedures are like. In, how are we going to deal with conflict inside TPP. I do know about that. And it is absolutely in America's interest, long-term structural interest, for us to be championing TPP. We're going to regret it if we walk away. And I think everybody else in Asia is moving forward with TPP. 
You know, they're hoping that we'll at some point catch up. I hope we do too. But it is a f profoundly important national security imperative. Okay, so I had not intended to Fred's uh, introduction and Adam's introduction led me to want to just say that, that I think we just, we have to start talking about this in terms of its fundamental contribution to our security. And that isn't just building a stronger economy, it's establishing the norms of cooperation throughout the world. That's fundamental. Now let me just shift to talk a little bit about uh, NAFTA, and I, I must admit I am preciously limited in what I know about NAFTA. Um, much of it really comes from the trip that I took with Evan Greenberg down to Mexico in the spring. We went to Mexico City, he invited me to go with him. You know, I'm embarrassed to say I'd never been to Mexico before. You know, I've been to Europe maybe 80 times, 90 times, been to Asia probably 70 times, 60 times. Never been to Mexico. Isn't that typical? I'm probably pretty typical of a lot of Americans. It's our neighbor and we don't know a damn thing about him. At least I didn't. And uh, so it was a remarkable experience for me to go down and to see this Mexico. I don't know the Mexico that existed prior to NAFTA, but I did have a chance to see this Mexico. And it was a, a remarkable experience. Um, it all came home in a very painful way uh, two weeks ago. Uh, one of a uh, wonderful young professional that works for me, um, his uh, sister and her boyfriend were traveling through a rather rural, remote part of Mexico. Unbelievably uh, hot day. Uh, their vehicle was uh, went off the road. They were they survived that, but they were 12 miles away from, they knew where there was a, a rest stop, they were 12 miles away, decided to walk and the young woman died on this path. She, combination of dehydration, heat stroke, and she died. Um, and we went full scale to try to get her body repatriated. Uh, they were, uh, Orthodox, and of course you know the tradition, you bury as soon as you possibly can, and if somebody is supposed to accompany the body, uh, her mom went down, and she was stuck. I don't know how many of you have ever dealt with trying to repatriate a, a, a body. It is complicated any place. And uh, what changed this situation was we called someone in the Department of Homeland Security, and they said, do you have anybody that you can work with on the, on the Mexican side to help us clear customs. And he said, sure, we'll get right back to you. Um, it, took, uh, it took about 20 minutes for the body to pass through customs because it had all been worked out because of this relationship. Now, it, it's uh, a little thing. That would never have happened 25 years ago. That would never have happened 25 years ago because we didn't have those relationships. Those relationships were built by people working side by side, helping each other on the little things in life, not just the big things. The big things, obviously, are, uh, which I learned about on, on this uh, trip, is astounding. We have the deepest, most intimate security relationship uh, with with Mexico more than any other country in the world. We talk about the special relationship with the United Kingdom, you know, we, we obviously, but it is nothing compared to the depth of this relationship we have with Mexico. We stand side by side in intelligence fusion centers. Um, when El Chapo was arrested, that came from an American intercept passed to Mexican authorities in one of our joint facilities to be able to apprehend him. Uh, we, jointly, uh, we jointly stand together on the southern border of Mexico. We helped construct 13 facilities on the southern border to help intercept migrants that are coming from Central America. Uh, our connections with Mexico on, on security are profound. I've, spent 
couple of hours with the finance minister in Mexico. He was delineating all of the ways we work together on uh, money laundering. I mean, the depth of cooperation on true hard security issues is deep and profound, and it's 24 years old. None of this existed before NAFTA. And the reason is because NAFTA gave uh, Mexico pride of place to stand with us on a range of issues. We have a complicated history on security with Mexico. As you know, I mean, uh, we'd, we'd probably be pissed too if we were on their side thinking about what happened. You know, we um, marched in, uh, fought a very difficult war, and took away half of their country. You know, made it our own. That, that's the backdrop. Americans don't think about that. That's the backdrop that every Mexican is aware of. And um, so we had, when I was in, in government and I was in the Defense Department, we had virtually no relationship with Mexico. Virtually none. It was the very f early days of NAFTA. It was not in time for any of that to show up while I was there. We couldn't, uh, we couldn't even arrange for ex you know, the chief of staff to come to Washington. We tried. It was just very difficult relation because of this long history, very difficult history with Mexico. All of that is gone. Every bit of that is gone. We now have the most intimate relationship with our southern neighbors we have long had with Canada. You know, now we did, uh, you know, we, we, we had our tough moments with Canada. Everybody talks about the British, you know, how pissed we are that they burned down Washington. You know, they did that in retribution because we burned down York, which was the capital of Canada. I mean, we started it. Okay. Uh, we had difficult relationship with Mexico, but that was long, long ago and when Mex when, uh, with uh, Canada. And when Canada became a, a, um, an independent nation 100 years ago, 150 years ago, uh, they had to figure out what was going to be the relationship with us. And uh, that started a long history of collaboration, which we never had with Mexico until NAFTA. NAFTA is that foundation. It is, as I heard many times down, it is an exoskeleton of cooperation. NAFTA gives us a chance to work side by side with dignity with a country that really had a, a legitimate chip on its shoulder. We're now working through it. And I would argue it has been a booming success. More Mexicans returned to Mexico than came to the United States over the last three years because there are economic opportunities. This has long been the theme that if you're going to solve the problem with a very poor neighbor on your borders, you have to help them grow their economy. And that's what everybody in Europe is now realizing they have to do about North Africa. So we, we've pioneered the way, it's been a security issue, it's been a, unbelievably valuable to us, and we cannot afford to let it collapse. We'll be far less secure if we do. Thank you for listening to me, and Fred, I think we're gonna talk. Huh? Okay, thank you. Yeah, I think so. John, thank you very much for those remarks. That was uh, bringing home, very close to home, in fact, some, uh, yeah. some realities that uh, people don't know about and need to know about. Um, before we focus on NAFTA, which we will today, uh, I can't resist picking up your uh, initial reflections on TPP and how much weight you give them. And I suspect most of the group here today cares about TPP also. So let me ask your advice on what is now a crucial operational issue concerning TPP. President Trump dropped the US out for the moment. There is quite an effort among the other 11 to keep it going. 
What's your advice in terms of what's best for U.S. foreign policy and national security, taking the long view? Should they go ahead, create the TPP of 11, and leave an open door for the United States, or would that in some way be adverse for us? No, I, unequivocally, we should ask them to move ahead. They should push forward as, as, as fast as they can. And what, what uh, brought that to home was uh, about two weeks ago, we hosted uh, four ambassadors from South America on something called the Pacific Alliance. I'd never heard of it before. I don't know what the hell the Pacific Alliance was. You know, typical, You're obviously not a trade guy. I'm not a trade guy. And, uh, and so I didn't know anything about it. And uh, that morning, the ambassador from Chile uh, led the conversation. The first thing he said was, "Our we want to champion the rules that are in TPP. That is the foundation for us going forward with the Pacific Alliance." And uh, and then he started to delineate the the observer membership. I think there are 49, 50 countries that have official observer status, and there are several who are right in the queue started, that they're going to start allowing in to the Pacific Alliance, all with the foundation of the ground rules of TPP. It is far more important, I think, for the TPP signatories to move ahead now to keep this norm uh, to establish this norm and to keep strength behind that norm. And then at some point, we're going to have to have this conversation in America. Are we going to be left behind? We are being left behind every day because we're not willing to do anything on trade. And it's going to hurt us in the long run. So I absolutely think we should encourage them to move forward. And if they do, and I agree with you, I think most of our folks here agree with you, if they do that, should they at some point reach out to China to see if it could join? Yes. I think, again, you, the, the, we wanted to. We, we wanted to bring China into TPP. But we but said we did. We said we did. I mean, I, but I, again, it, we're trying to establish the norms that are inside TPP as part of the, um, the, uh, con the connective tissue that establishes Western values in Asia and around the world. I mean, they're firmly grounded in Europe. They're, they are actually quite broadly based in Asia now by these signatories. We need to expand that. That is so, so incredibly in our national interest. And so I would say, absolutely. Let me turn to NAFTA. And before opening up to the audience, ask one or two questions on that. To me, the big overriding question going into the NAFTA renegotiation is whether it will succeed in keeping NAFTA alive. I think less than three months ago, the president quite proudly said he had decided to withdraw. He got a lot of pushback, fortunately, from his own people, from constituencies here, from the other countries, and so grudgingly said, OK, I'll renegotiate. But if I don't get what I want, I still hope the possibility of withdrawing. And as Adam mentioned elliptically, the president's focus has been on things that are just unrealistic, inappropriate, and in fact bizarre from trying to get out of a trade negotiation, namely a big change in your trade balance. Won't work, can't work, particularly when you're dealing with two countries who have bigger trade deficits than you do. Both Canada and Mexico have global current account deficits bigger than that of the United States. So it's not as if we're dealing with some countries that have a lot of flexibility to bring down their surpluses. All of which says that if the president was dissatisfied with the outcome, he could conceivably blow it up. Now, I quoted General Powell from over 20 years ago, saying that if there was no NAFTA then, he might have some successor might have to put five divisions on the border. What if NAFTA did blow up now, John? What if, take the worst case, but it's not, I think, a totally unrealistic case by any means. What if it did blow up? What if President Trump was dissatisfied with the outcome, withdrew from the agreement, and all the things you talked about were put at least into suspense? How would you imagine things evolving from that point? Well, I think the... Uh, a 
pulling out of NAFTA would also trigger political developments within Mexico that would have the largest impact. I mean, we have, we've enjoyed a constructive relationship with Mexican governments for the last 23, 24 years. Um, there is um, there's a very strong chance that these political parties are in some trouble, you know, because of corruption, honestly. And one of the things I heard repeatedly in Mexico when I was down with, with Evan was how much Mexico wants a revitalized NAFTA to help deal with corruption issues. Uh, it was a very interesting argument. I had not anticipated that. Um, but if NAFTA fails, we pull out, NAFTA collapses, it's going to put energy behind a progressive left government. Uh, for possibly having a progressive left government that has a lot of animosities revolving around us. Uh, so I would see it, I would see suspension of uh, the cooperation in the intelligence centers. Undoubtedly, we would pull back from the uh, forward posture we have with uh, customs and immigration. And we would be much more in a reflexive stop it at the border, you know. Uh, now, this is, this is an, an emotional problem that Americans struggle to get over because we have had such a long history of being such a powerful country. We have the impression that we can literally stop things at our border. Well, um, like Ebola. <laughs> you know, I mean, if you think about it, I mean, all of the really tough problems in the world are horizontal and all the governments are vertical. So how do you deal with truly complicated problems that have their origin outside of your sovereign remit? You have to find patterns where you're cooperating with each other. We're going to have to come up with some new formula if this were to happen, because we cannot afford to have, because of our insatiable desire for illegal drugs in this country, we cannot afford to have the countries in Central and South America be overwhelmed by, by drug traffickers. And we know that uh, illegal um, criminal activity tends to be the logistics backbone that terrorists use around the world because they already have networks. They know how to move money. They knew how to covertly move people. We will have a much worse time if, we, if NAFTA were to collapse on hard security issues, not just emotional issues, hard, tough security issues. It will be a lot tougher. That's where I don't know if we put five divisions on the border. I would, <laughs> but I have no doubt that we would mobilize the Guard for permanent mission. I have no doubt of that. Okay. The floor is open for questions, comments, and reflections on any of this wide range of issues that John has uh, put on the table. Yeah, and so go to the standing mic, or there's a traveling mic, introduce yourself and tell us where you're from. Uh, Raul Hinojosa from um, University of California, occupied Mexico, as they say. Um, uh, I'd like to ask a question about uh, migration, because this is an issue that um, is, is outside of NAFTA, it was never a part of NAFTA, but currently the potential for the policy shift that is being already carried out and is attempting to, to think about a much more draconian uh, um, path could have very severe consequences. Sherman Robinson and I here at PIA have just finished a, a paper looking at the economic impacts of and following through with the deportation of just the undocumented, just the Mexicans, the other undocumented. It's basically multiples of wiping out all the positive impacts that have come from trade liberalization or could come from it, let alone the impact in terms of poverty and the likely scenario of large-scale refugee migration to the border. And then that, you're going to need a lot more than the... Uh, uh, than the National Guard at that point, and Central America, the same story. H how do you uh, um, begin to s put this picture together in terms of how we need to also 
address the immigration issue in an intelligent way at the same time that we're thinking about this, this uh, averting a disaster on the trade side? Well, I, uh, I probably don't have conventional views on, uh, on immigration. I, I, I would take as many immigrants into America as I could. I think it's a very good thing. Uh, I think we're the luckiest country in the world that we've, we're populated by people that wanted to come here, wanted to come here. And it, it's created the foundation of a, of a very innovative society. Uh, it's, it's unequivocally good. And that includes illegal uh, aliens. Um, we do need to find a way so that they can become legal. Now, I think we're somehow we're going to have to develop a guest worker program you know, in America so that we can take care of a big part of it and then find this pathway to citizenship. I'm very disappointing that uh, both political parties are not really interested in solving this problem. Republicans can't solve it internally because of the civil war that's going on inside the Republican Party. And honestly, the Democrats love to have the problem rather than the solution. It's good for them, you know. So I mean, this is, it's a cynical problem that we have, but we have both parties that for different reasons are not trying to solve this problem. It is a solvable problem. Of course, are there going to be uh, questions of injustice and all that? Well, yeah, there are. Every, every complex political problem is that, but it isn't going to get better with the current stalemate that we have. You know, so we should try to find a pathway. Now, and again, uh, this came from talking to the chief of police in Los Angeles. He said, "You cannot, you cannot protect a people if you if you make them afraid. It's not possible to do quality policing if you have an, a population that's afraid of the police. That's a, that's fundamental." I mean, I, I can't overstate how important that is. So are we going to be safer on the streets any place in America if we have you know, 20 million people afraid of their own government? Not at all. It's impossible. So it, it's, uh, in my mind, it is part of a seamless whole. We do need to solve the problem. It is a solvable problem. And in, but again, I also have a very, I, I love having immigrants in America. I think it's the best thing that we have. And so I'm not afraid of this issue. I'm not, you know, politicians are, and, uh, and they have a very angry constituency that is looking just paper thin deep about the problem rather than looking deeply about the problem. From a security standpoint, we, we need to solve it without making uh, Americans afraid of their, of their police authorities and ultimately of government security authorities. Okay, next question. Uh, very bashful audience today. <laughs> Come on, more questions. Well, they're, they're here to really talk, to hear the panel. And, more and questions. Well, all right, but I've got another one for you then. I want to go back to where you started with how all this trade stuff fits into our overall foreign policy. And this is broader than both NAFTA and TPP, but includes them both. This administration's trade policy as a whole has scared the bejesus out of the rest of the world. Saw it in G20 last week. We've seen it repeatedly. So what's the tangible result? Well, there are a couple one can point to, and I want to ask you for your reaction to them and what you think they say and how you think we should react to them. One is the TPP-11, which is going ahead seemingly, with your advice, to continue the arrangement, put it in place, maybe expand it to bring in the Pacific Alliance, but to have an agreement without the United States. The second that I thought very interesting was this rapid acceleration between the European Union and Japan. The other two big economies, or two of the other three big economies in the world, who had been negotiating in a desultory way for several years, and all of a sudden, didn't resolve all their specific details, but made a big show out of coming together uh, to demonstrate that the rest of the world was not going to be deflected from an open trading system by the Trump administration. 
So those are two kind of big developments by big countries, major parts of the world, reacting not as some people feared to emulate the protectionism of our administration, but to the contrary, go any other way. In fact, some Machiavellian free traders might say, great thing. This was the way to get the rest of the world to overcome their hangups and start pursuing freer trade. Um, but what about the foreign policy implications? Uh, and throw in Chancellor Merkel's acid comments uh, uh, from her recent meetings with the president. Uh, how, does all, how does all that, in your view, affect the overall US role in the world, our security posture, and indeed our national security uh, in a world which suddenly seems to be, at least on these issues, and throw in climate change, uh, going its own way without the United States? You know, it, for other reasons, I had occasion to go back and look at the historical origins of the Marshall Plan. Right now, of course, we had the 70th anniversary uh, about a month ago, but uh, the Marshall Plan was, uh, it was not a brilliant conceptualized design. It was an emergency. Um, the economies of Europe were lower in 1947 than they were in 1945. It was they, they were it was deep crisis because of the of the uh, of the tensions with Russia. Russia uh, discontinued. Um, allowing food to be imported from Eastern Europe, which had historically been a breadbasket for Western Europe. Um, it, was, it was a crisis. We knew we could not, and we saw the, we saw the Cold War in front of us. Uh, we knew we couldn't afford to do it with military alone. So we needed allies, and we needed healthy allies. Uh, so we made a, what was by the sweep of the goal, a relatively modest investment in today's dollars of $150 billion uh, to create what we now see is the foundation of a free and progressive Western system built around progressive liberal values. By that, I mean traditional liberal in a European sense values, not, not in American politics sense. Um, it, where the foundation of society is rule of law, where it's representative governments, it's accountable, governments accountable to courts, um, transparent uh, uh, journalism, honest journalism. You know, that was the foundation that we created. We, we, we needed it because we knew we couldn't afford to fight the Soviet Union and all of its allies um, with just military force. It was, it, it was a brilliant move, which we had to stumble into because of this crisis, this economic crisis. It, that has, that's really the foundation for our, us in Asia. You know, we have tremendous support in Asia, and, it's, and what, do we have, what do we have military in Asia? Well, we do have, we do have a, about 40% of the Navy, you know, in terms of floating Navy. Uh, but we have one army division, you know, I mean, and yet we are able to sustain this because, not because of the military might, but because of the, of the values that we espouse. And they're primarily grounded around economic values. You know, I mean, there's um, uh, rule of law, which, which is something that, that progressives champion, is predictability of contracts. You know, for businessmen, I mean, it is you. You have a you have a predictable, manageable. You could evaluate the risk because you've got this legal framework, and that that grows out of the out of the values that we created. So, in my view, um, look, I was in defense business for 25 years. We're a, we play a supporting role for America's power. It's an important role because we have to ensure that we and our allies are not vulnerable to, a, to acts of intimidation. But we're never, we didn't win the Cold War because the military was in Europe. We won the Cold War because our ideas were superior. 
and they were carried by, by business and civil society. And so I, uh, I think this is even more the case in Asia. You know, we're not going to, we're not, well, first of all, we're not going to ever invade China for crying out loud, but we do, we could stumble into a, into a crisis with them. We're never going to win it militarily. We're going to have to do it by prevailing with the quality of the ideas we champion. Okay, back to questions. Bill Lane. Um, thank you, Fred, and uh, great presentation. Um, I was struck by something Adam said, which was both sides I mean, played a role in, um, in the NAFTA debate, as did Gary and a lot of people in this room. Uh, but the statement that Adam said was, we oversold NAFTA. And so here we are 25 years later. Um, Seven billion people live outside the United States. 155 million of those seven billion people live in Canada and Mexico, yet they represent one-third of all American exports. The number one tourist destination by Americans is to Mexico by country. Um, is the issue that we oversold NAFTA, or is it the issue that we quit selling NAFTA? And I would say, is the business community selling NAFTA now? Um, you know, business is pretty good at just-in-time lobbying, but maybe we got, maybe we lost that, and now we're doing just-in-case lobbying. But uh, we need to do something different. And right now, I would say most Americans don't realize the magnitude of exports to our NAFTA partners. Few know that it's the number one tourist uh, uh, destination. Few understand the service surplus that we have with Mexico and Canada. So my question is, what should we in the business community be doing better? Well, I, uh, again, you, I'm looking at an audience that knows a hell of a lot more about business than I do. I'm a, I'm a government guy, a defense guy. But um, it seems to me that what NAFTA really did was it helped the American economy stay competitive at a time when China and other countries were rising and had such a radically different price point for labor. How were we going to compete and sell goods unless we could broaden the base of, our, uh, of the cost of input to our products. And that was where NAFTA became essential. I mean, the entire US economy benefited because we were able to take advantage of less expensive labor in Mexico. Now, that came at the expense of blue collar workers in the United States. And um, that was unavoidable. Uh, and shame on us for not doing a better job of helping them with with transition through a very difficult period. We're now, I think, living with this terrible, terrible opioid thing, which is highly concentrated in places where you have a lot of poor people without hope. And we allowed that to happen. But that, that shouldn't be seen as being undermining the value of NAFTA. NAFTA was crucial for the rest of the economy, everybody else. And so I, um, I think the business community has not done a, a strong job. To be candid, most of, the, most of the business community that's represented here in Washington, uh, they're all transfixed by uh, tax reform. I don't see them championing uh, NAFTA. I see them trying to survive a NAFTA debate, but not championing NAFTA. And I, the way they are just championing tax reform, they're preoccupied with it right now. And I, I can understand that, but uh, there's so much at risk if, if NAFTA were to collapse. Well, so, so that compounds the risk, you're saying? It compounds that risk, and, uh, and the business community needs to be more aggressive. This is one of the, one of the things I admire with, with Chubb. Chubb has taken this on to push the business community forward, to say we've got to be more engaged in NAFTA, not just pretend that it's going to play out well through its own forces. You all know if, if, we, if it carries into next year, it's going to be problematic what Mexico can do in an election year. You know, and so we've got to do, we've got to come to a framework this year. And I say that from a national security standpoint. We have a question from one of our colleagues from Canada and then former Congressman Bustani. <clears throat> Hi. 
Patrick Leblanc from the Center for International Governance Innovation. Uh, I think on the, on the business uh, perspective, if I may just make a comment, I think mostly why business, and it's not just here in the US, it's in Canada, I think it's all over the world, has, has not made the case for free trade, it's just it's taken it for granted. I mean, basically since you know, we got NAFTA, since we got uh, the WTO, the job was done. The rest was just kind of small issues, but free trade was taken for granted. Now maybe, you know, with the, uh, the, the U.S. withdrawal from TPP and potentially withdrawal from NAFTA, now maybe it's helping to focus the mind, but that's true. The, the, the business community certainly has, has a job to do in terms of convincing the wider public as to the benefits uh, of free trade here in North America, but even uh, more, uh, more widely. Uh, my, my question, going back to the security issue, and, and you mentioned, uh, you know, how... NAFTA has been important uh, in terms of the security relationship between the United States and uh, and Mexico. And uh, Fred mentioned Colin Powell, kind of you know trying to convince uh, Congress people to uh, to favor NAFTA uh, back in '93. Uh, if the security argument uh, was compelling back then, why is it not compelling right now? I mean, certainly. You've made the case in terms of TPP, how important as an agreement it is for US security interests, uh, and, and certainly how NAFTA remains uh, relevant for US security interests. So notwithstanding the, the, the economic benefits, uh, which might be a little bit harder sometimes to convince, and, and certainly in terms of distributional issues, but security is kind of a broader thing, which you know, should be easy to convince both maybe the president, but also uh, other people around the White House and in Congress. Why is that argument not resonating this time, whereas it did 25 years ago? Thank you. Well, I, I don't think so many people are making the argument. Uh, I think it should be more widely discussed. Um, I, mean, to be, to, I, I think the dilemma on NAFTA is um, the president's ally on this are the Democrats. And the Democrats don't want to do anything to help Donald Trump. And Republicans are afraid of bringing something up where Trump is aligned with their, with their opponent. So there's a, it's a remarkably limited debate on, on NAFTA. Um, I, there have been a few hearings, not, nothing terribly, it's, nobody's really beating the, the drum. So which is part of the reason why it was so important for us to do this conference. I mean, we've got, to, we've got to start putting these issues on the table and say, pay attention to this. This is crucial. But I, it's, it's because of the, the artifice of this politics and how NAFTA is, being, is playing it. I, the Democrats are, are wrong on trade. I, I just hate to say it. They're, they're just wrong on trade. They, they view this thing very narrowly because of the way that constituencies have made it a litmus test for them. Uh, if, but when you talk to when you talk to them and you lay out national security arguments, they agree. They nod their head yes. But we're not doing that on NAFTA, and we need we need we need to do more of that. Actually, part of why we're here. Charles. Thank you. Great conversation and uh, discussion. I wish the rest of America could hear this kind of conversation, and that's the fundamental problem. We're not getting the message out. Um, I've been a number of think tank events around town talking about trade and how it links up with our foreign policy. But we're, we're in closed doors and we're not getting that message broadly out. Business is situational as you pointed out. I mean, I dealt with that for 12 years. Everybody comes in on trade issues with a very specific issue. But we're not making the compelling case since the fall of the, of the, uh, the wall we, we went from a, a situation where we knew what the foreign policy was. It was basically a containment policy in a, in a uh, binary world. Since then, we're dealing with a situation that we don't have a paradigm to think about. That's why we need to get back to the things that drove foreign policy starting in the 30s after we overcame isolationism and, and then put together a construct that both sides of, of the spectrum politically could agree to, presidents on both sides, as well as the business com community, we were linked. I would submit it's energy security and trade, the expansion of trade, integration of, of, uh, of economics, 
and energy security broadly, where it's open markets. Again, linking up with trade. Last point, I know there was a group that came together in the late 30s to fight isolationism. There were people in academia, gov former government officials, currently serving uh, people in government, as well as the business community that came together to do that. Perhaps now's the time to start thinking about how we link those kinds of forces together to overcome all the misinformation that's out there on why uh, we've lost a lot of jobs in this, this country because of automation and other aspects of globalization, not necessarily trade. We've got to get the facts out. We've got to do it in a compelling way. And we've, we've got to have a vehicle to do it. I think that's what's missing. I'd like your comments on that. Well, I, I, uh, I absolutely agree. And I, and I, do, I also believe that um, we should be going back to the fundamentals. It, we, we don't have that transcending paradigm of a single opponent that was that it, it, it made it easier but I would argue the conclusion we came to to deal with uh, the Soviet Union uh, is just as legitimate today as it was then which is we don't want to do it with just a military force and we want to have allies it's a hell of a lot I mean think of how fortunate we are that we had allies it was Harold Brown who once famously said he thought it was very fortunate that it was the Soviet Union and not America that was surrounded by hostile communist powers. You know, I mean, no, nobody liked them. We had the great advantage that people genuinely welcomed American leadership in the world. I think we should strive for that again. Uh, but what do we do? It isn't to sell our products. It is to champion the ideals that are good for us and good for everyone. And I think we've neglected that. You know, we've been so boastful about America. We haven't really been willing to champion. It can be other forms of representative government. It doesn't have to be our version of democracy. But we should say rule of law. We champion rule of law. We champion accountability of governments. We champion a free press. I mean, these are everybody in the world will resonate to that and we should be embracing those values again. I think we're a, we're a little confused right now in America. I think this election showed that we were confused and uh, I, abs I think we have to reclaim this space. It's exactly the same space that we, had, that we were fighting for in 1947-48. Let's go back, let's reclaim it and, and argue to the American people why it's important for us. And I think those coalitions that Charles mentioned in the late 30s actually included labor unions who were very concerned about U.S. role in the world and, and played a very constructive role in that. So one would hope that that inclusivity could uh, expand today. Now we've got a number of questions. Okay, you've warmed everybody up. Okay, one, two, three, four, and maybe we'll take them all and then John can answer them all. Sure, please. Uh, John Mullen, McCl McClarty Associates. I would I would point out that that Ash Carter uh, said several times that TPP was worth an aircraft carrier to him. Um, um, the world seems to be organizing uh, around the United States without United States leadership. Um, what I'm wondering is the linkage of the Western Hemisphere uh, with with Asia. The first meeting of the TPP-11 was organized by the Pacific Alliance in Viña del Mar, Chile. Um, and they, of course, invited the Chinese and the, and the Koreans uh, as, as well. Um, you're right, there are observers uh, in the Pacific Alliance, and some of them are negotiating for uh, 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 permanent membership. New Zealand is, is one of the first in the queue. Um, we were the champions. Fred Bergsten was one of the champions of the free trade uh, agreement of the, uh, the area of the Asia Pacific, or FTAP, uh, the Bogar Goals, 1994, I think so. Yep. Um, the Chinese raised that again in, in the, the Beijing APEC summit in, in, in 2014. Um, my question is, should the United States be championing that again as a way to link 
um, uh, the Western Hemisphere uh, with, with Asia. Um, uh, last comment on that, Joe Biden gave a speech at George Washington University a number of years ago when he was going out of his way to connect everything from India uh, to at least the Pacific side of, of the Western Hemisphere. Uh, that seems like a possible path for me, which, which, is, which is big picture and important for the U.S. Yeah. My, my name is Don Kirk. I spend a lot of time in Korea and Japan as a journalist. Uh, there's a lot of talk, consensus here seems to be that TPP and NAFTA and Chorus 2 probably are great. But there's also a sense that of a lot of non-tariff barriers that are obstructing Chorus and would make TPP unviable as well, and maybe NAFTA too. So I, and I don't, haven't, haven't heard the word non-tariff barrier come up in this conversation. Maybe I missed something. But I wonder if you could comment on that aspect. Well, hang on for the next panel because uh, okay. they will be discussing <laughs> non-tariff and other barriers uh, at length and trying to Thank come well, to Mr. grips Humphrey's with comments will be very <laughs> come, come to grips with the economics of the agreement. We can't ask Dr. Hamry to do that, but yeah, uh, whatever he wants to say. Lila. Hi, I'm Lila Afas with Toyota. Um, I was in a meeting last week and heard some administration officials saying. They wanted to prevent another Venezuela on our southern border, so I think they're understanding the security implications of a breakdown in negotiations. But how can we broadcast that across the country, much to the how can we broadcast the benefits of free trade? But also, since you mentioned, you know, sort of coming out of the devastation of World War II and the Marshall Plan and, you know, when the greatest generation set up these institutions, um, the generation after didn't really keep them going and keep them viable. And then when we saw the financial crisis sort of decimate our country and, and countries that are still trying to claw their way out of it, uh, I think it that really resonated with people in terms of these, this isn't working, the system isn't working, and the finance industry is one of the most regulated industries um, in the entire world, even more than my industry in the auto sector. But uh, how can we revitalize those institutions? And what role do international institutions, beyond just the WTO, play and sort of moving forward and, and helping revitalize sort of the benefits of globalization and, and looking at it with those security aspects as well. Gary. Well, thanks very much for a most interesting session. I'm Gary Uffbauer here at the Institute. Uh, today, um, if they stick with the schedule, Lighthizer is supposed to tell us what the U.S. objectives are We'll see. But my question for you, John, is how close is the administration, in your judgment, to pushing Mexico and possibly Canada, but let's concentrate on Mexico, to take a preemptive move and terminate NAFTA because the U.S. demands are so extravagant? Oh. Uh, well, so four, four easy ones for you, John. <laughs> yeah. Well, first, I mean, um, it was interesting what happened when the president um, was going to pull out an after the, uh, I think it was back in March. And um, the first phone call that, that kind of w went out to, was to the Secretary of Defense. The Secretary of Defense was the first guy to weigh in and say, I got to come over and talk to you. I can't let this happen. Um, and then it led to some others, and ultimately I think the real transformation was when the Secretary of Agriculture came in with a, with a couple of charts, you know, but... Um, Vote charts. But, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, but, but the Secretary of Defense was the first guy to call in and say, Mr. President, I've got to talk to you about that. I don't think that's going to change. Uh, I think that the security establishment knows how much we need. Um, we'll always have Canada for other reasons. Um, you know, because, and we have structures with Canada, NORAD, et cetera. You know, we'll always have, we'll have but, but with Mexico, it is dependent on NAFTA. And you're going to see, I think, the Secretary will weigh in. And I think you're going to see the, foreign, the, the Secretary of State will weigh in. I think you'll, you'll see quite an active force. I, do I, th I don't personally think that, that the idea of a preemptive withdrawal is likely. 
that would be my guess. Um, you know, the, this question about uh, about the lack of commitment to institutions is, I think, is a very interesting one. Um, you know, there are really two forms of internationalism. Structural internationalism, which depends on a treaty, you know, and an institution, uh, and then what, uh, then coalitions of the willing. You know, in many ways, uh, Pacific Alliance is interesting because it's kind of a hybrid in a sense, but it is still a coalition of the willing. Uh, structural internationalism, like the United Nations system, is, is very powerful because it's normative. You know, it establishes norms that get handed to the next generation. Uh, that doesn't mean, you know, popularly we've lost interest in the UN, but the UN is overwhelmingly uh, authoritative every place in the world except the United States, you know. Um, We've, we've have a preference for coalitions of the willing because they're so easy to establish compared to treaty-based structural internationalism. Uh, the problem with coalitions of the willing is they're not normative. So a coalition that, that will come together to deal with migration is not one that's going to come together and deal with trade. I mean, coalitions of the willing are very much tied to the emotions of the of the leadership of the countries uh, and the, an immediate urgent need, but it doesn't tend to be normative over time. What's really interesting about uh, Pacific Alliance is that it really is turning into a hybrid. It really started off as a coalition of the willing that's gradually bringing more structure because the signatories are starting to pass, you know, harmonize their legal environments, you know, to, rep to represent the agreement in the Pacific uh, Alliance. I think that's likely to be the pattern going forward. I mean, that's what TPP is, you know, really. TPP is, a, again, it's a, it is a coalition of the willing, but it does have things that we're willing to bind ourselves. And I think that's probably going to be the more dominant pattern of internationalism going forward, uh, just because it's, it's too hard to create omnibus institutions anymore. Uh, the question is, can we revitalize them? Can we revitalize um, the United Nations? I think we should. I think we should try. Uh, it makes no sense to have uh, the people with a veto, uh, the five nations that have a veto in the United Nations, three of them are European. I mean, it makes no sense to not have India or or Japan, yeah. I mean, so but but trying to make that shift is so hard. You know, it's, it's virtually impossible. We do so. I, I think we're going to be in a world where coalitions of the willing that evolve into more standing structures are going to be more likely, and trade's leading the way. Trade is leading the way on that. So I think that's a it's a good thing. That's one of the another reason why I support it from a national security standpoint because I think the more we see uh, structures that that are based on on fair process, you know, due process, is a, is a foundation for having to not having to use military all the time. You know, and we've we, we've way overused the military over the last fifteen years, in my in my view. Um, you know, I don't know a, a darn thing about non tariff barriers. I hear them. And I should listen to the guys that are coming too. I know exactly what you're talking about. You know, I, I'm afraid I'm heading to Japan tomorrow, and uh, you know, they we've got a wonderful relationship with uh, with the Japanese, better than ever any time in history. You don't ever see American cars in Japan. You know, I mean, so there there's there's clearly is uh, there clearly are ways that 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 markets are being constricted through internal regulation, and that's something for you guys to. Talk through. We'll talk about that later. Okay, you talk about that later. You you guys talk about that later. Uh, and um, so I think I, I think I got all the. the yeah, the one other thing that you quite legitimately didn't try to answer was this question about the free trade area of the Asia Pacific. Oh, yeah. Should the U.S. go for that? Um, 
Well, the original visionary strategy of some folks in this business was that after you got the TPP, and maybe after the Asians did their RCEP, their yeah. Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, that then the next step, maybe a decade later, would be some fusion or amalgamation or somehow pull together the whole region into an FTAP. Now that progression has obviously been interrupted. So the question is whether the disruption of the TPP from a US standpoint puts all that on indefinite hold, maybe forever, or this would be the hopeful interpretation, whether maybe the president having rejected the TPP, but then facing all this backlash, including the rest of the world going on without us, would suddenly say, well, I have to find a way to recoup without acknowledging I made an error by dropping out of the TPP. Well, the big picture way to do that would be to say, sure, FTAP, and take credit for it. Good enough. If he wants to do that, I'd say all, all for him. That would be a, an optimistic rendition of what would go on because the FTAP would include China and it wouldn't deal with trade balances and all that. So it would have to overcome a lot of hurdles. So I'd say at the moment, the idea is in uh, suspended animation at best, but one could at least conceive of a route back if one wanted to be uh, far-sighted and optimistic. I want to thank John Hamry. This was enormous help to us, sharing your experience, your wisdom, your knowledge about all these things. We thank you enormously. Adam's back. We're going to go to lunch and then proceed. Adam, Adam comes back for lunch and to thank John. Thank you. Thank you. Um, just a quick reminder that we, this is the first barrel of a double-barreled set of substance. After Fred and John, we're going to have 15 minutes for lunch break. Our friends online, of course, can go get whatever takeout they want. And then we will have a high-level panel with Chad Bown on Trump approach to U.S. trade law, Dan Esty on environment and NAFTA, Patrick LeBlanc on modernizing NAFTA, including issues of gender and human rights, and then our own Gary Huffbauer, of course, on energy and NAFTA, a critical sector. Again, thanks to Fred. Thanks especially to John. Reconvene shortly. <laughs>